were in Plano for the summer? I was in a uh, Houston area. Okay. Oh man, that's high infection. <laughs> yeah. Well, Paris we're like an hour outside, so it was a little bit better. But yeah, no, it's a. Uh, it was. It was pretty bad over there. It was still Harris County. Yeah. Oh. Scary. Yep. All right. What's up, Danelle? Pierre, welcome. What's up? Uh, hi, Pierre. Gonna be just hey. a couple minutes. We'll let people straggle in. <clears throat> I'm glad, glad we could, we could all get together and do this. This is, um, this is gonna be fun. And I tell you, this is the more I study, the more I study this zone offense, the more impressed I am. It is, it's, it's a treat. It's a real treat to be able to learn this stuff. It's unscoutable, huh? Unscoutable. <laughs> No, but for real, our kids, uh, it was tough. Is Steve on? Matthew, is Steve on? Uh, he was on, he tried to get on earlier today, I got notified, but I haven't seen him on now. I think he's driving home, actually. He's driving oh, back from to Oklahoma. Yeah. There we go. It is traffic as bad in Los Angeles as it was before the pandemic? Not I, as, I don't I'm think it's bad. LA, but it's not as bad. But it's still it's bad. Bad. Yeah. bad, but not as bad. It's gotten progressively worse. You know, like the first month, it was like you cruise everywhere. But mm -hmm. it's gotten not, not as bad as it was, but it's pretty bad. These people yeah, have gotten just... braver. Yeah. It's the same way around here. Traffic has gotten progressively worse again. Is it back to its pre-COVID levels? I think it is. Really? I think it is. Wow. Well, I welcome the other, uh, some new faces. How are you guys doing? Welcome. And Keith Freeman. Keith, you there? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Welcome. Welcome. Matt you know the guy that writes everything down for me before. That was Keith. That's right. This That's job right. would keep me organized. <laughs> yeah, I think you referred to – was he the one sitting courtside in your championship productions video? Might have been. Yeah, because I kept hearing you say, Keith, Keith. Yeah. His job now is to test the theory if this stuff works with talented players because he's <laughs> in Mississippi State now. <laughs> awesome. Very good. Well, I'm glad to have you. Glad to have you. I think Laura's on the call, too, my former assistant. I am. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> How are you? Welcome. I'm finishing up my dinner, so I'm, like, running back and forth from the stove. So I'm not trying to be rude, but I just got to late we, start on it. Don't worry. I, I have a question, Laura. Did, mm -hmm. did we run this when you played? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, okay, I don't remember when we started running this. I sometimes started. we ran it. The only difference was sometimes we ran it with two flashers. Oh, okay. That was when we did we did it before. I remember now. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. All right. Well, Colleen, if you want to start us off with your uh, with your history of the game, and then as people can keep yeah. people trickle in, go ahead. Okay. Welcome everyone uh, once again to our pandemic uh, growth mindset group that Matthew has started, and as you know. Um, I always give my little snack tips, okay? So for today, my snack tip drinking-wise, because here in Sacramento, we have an excessive heat warning. We're not supposed to run the air conditioner until 10 p.m. Oh, but wow. I cheated last night. I turned mine on at 9.03. I couldn't stand it anymore. <laughs> so you got to stay hydrated. So here's tip number one, sparkling watermelon juice from Trader Joe's. It's delicious. It's got a little kick to it. Uh, Trader Joe's and then I mix it with coconut water and coconut water is a great hydrator so that's my drink for today my snack tip is Trader Joe's patio potato chips now it sounds horrible because these are the flavorings sea salt and vinegar like uh, home sale ketchup delicious dill and sweet barbecue flavor potato chips now I know it sounds horrible it was on sale one day for 99 cents. I bought a bag. I almost ate the whole thing. It's really good. So pair that with the watermelon juice. It makes for great snacks, summer snacks, okay? 
Secondly, you all know I have my music tips. So today, because we have an old school coach in Harry, and, and that's meant as a compliment, Harry, um, I dug out two of my favorite CDs. So here we have Tower of Power, back in the day. They're from Oakland, California. Really great uh, band. My favorite song is You're Still the Young Man. If you ever have the chance to hear the cut that they recorded live, I had it playing over and over forever. And the second music tip is Rolls Royce, Greatest Hits. This is a group that sang the soundtrack to Car Wash, but my favorite song of this one is called Wishing on a Star. So old school retro music, okay? So uh, also, um, I just wanna uh, welcome uh, all the ones who have joined today for the first time. And uh, before I forget, I wanna show my t-shirt message for the day. And it says, greatness is a habit. So all of you are tuning in, trying to make yourselves better, and it becomes a habit, and you'll be successful. So I usually give the historical tips. So today, in honor of uh, our guest from Villanova, I sort of skipped ahead in the AIW historical journey that I've been leading us on. And in 1982, that was the last AIW National Championship. It happened to be in Philadelphia. It was hosted by Villanova. And uh, by this time, the NCAA had sponsored its very first NCAA National Championship for women. So the teams, the schools were sort of divided on which championship they were going to enter. In the AIW bracket, there was only three top 20 women's team that decided to stay with the AIW. That was Villanova, Rutgers, and Texas. The 82 NCAA uh, National Championship was held in Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, Villanova uh, played Rutgers in the semifinals. Uh, however, they lost 83 to 75. And then in the other semifinals, it was Wayland Baptist, who remember last week I talked about the Wayland Baptist Flying Queens. They lost to Texas 82-63. So the final was Rutgers beating Texas 83 to 77. However, side note is that Villanova did beat Wayland Baptist to finish third in that national championship bracket. So, belated congrats, Harry. Thank you. Job well done. Thank and you. I want to, um, Harry, I started thinking about this, that it reminded me that at Villanova, he had a great, great player that started there 83 to 87. Her name was Shelly Pennefather. Some of you may have heard her, heard about her, but she was the 1987 Wade Trophy winner, which as I also uh, mentioned in a previous broadcast that she uh, was the top female basketball player in the country. Uh, in high school, in Colorado, she won three state championships going 70 and 0. And then one year she attended Notre Dame High School in New York where they were 26 and 0. So in high school, Shelly was undefeated. Uh, she also was three times the Big East Player of the Year, uh, All-American, and uh, again, uh, beat, uh, won the Wade Trophy. She is uh, the all-time leading scorer, both men and women, at Villanova. Similar to what I had mentioned earlier about Denise Curry being the all-time leading scorer for both men and women at UCLA. And however, um, Shelly uh, went overseas and played for, I think, three years, could have made a bundle of money, but she had this calling she decided to uh, join and become a cloistered nun. And I didn't realize this until I uh, saw a little bit of the documentary or read the story, but the clo the clo in 1991, um, well, let me backtrack. A cloistered nun means that you sleep on a straw mat, you go barefoot 23 hours of the day. The one hour that you get to put on shoes or sandals is when you walk around the courtyard for your exercise. You wake up, you can sleep at the most for four hours only. That's the most you can sleep. They wake up at 12.30 and start uh, saying prayers. And it's a, it's a very, very uh, primitive style of life, but they believe that they're, they pray and they, pray, they believe that prayers are for the salvation of the world uh, and for people. And it takes obviously a very special individual. So after she, and she became uh, Sister Rosemary of the Queen of Angels um, nunnery, I, I think. And so Harry, didn't you go visit her in 1991? Is that when yeah, you- Yeah, I, I get to visit her once a year. Uh, Shelly and I made a deal with the Mother Superior when she joined. 
So okay. I get to go once a year. And it's only for like 90 minutes, right? Yes, about an hour and a half. Okay. Well, in 19, uh, 2019 was the first time she was able to have physical contact, meaning she could hug her family or her friends. And the next time that she's allowed to do that is 25 years from then, which is 2044. So when I read that and saw part of that story, I mean, my gosh, I mean, her mother was in her 70s in uh, nine, 2019. So, you know, it's a long shot that she'll be able to hug her daughter uh, again. But I just thought that here's one of the top players in the, in, in the country and, you know, just made a decision and stuck with it. So it takes a lot of guts to do that and to really try and uh, or live that type of uh, lifestyle. So with that, that's my little historical tip of the day. Matthew? Thank you so much, Colleen. Love you coming on and sharing every week the history of the game, learning it firsthand. Much appreciated. Love it. Um, the uh, Our next guest needs no introduction, but I'm going to give one anyway. I'll give my, my best shot. Um, retired <clears throat> last season after 42 years as head coach of the Villanova women's basketball team. Uh, his in 2017-18, his team uh, won 23 games. It was the 20th season that the, uh, his team had won 20 games in his career. Um, they went 23 and nine and went to the second round of the NCAA tournament and lost to the eventual Notre Dame, the eventual champion. More on that game later. Uh, he also won 19 games six times in his career and 18 games twice. Uh, like you mentioned, Colleen, uh, he's got the one AIAW tournament, the 1982 Final Four, 11 WNIT tournament appearances, 11 NCAA tournament appearances, including the uh, 2003 Elite Eight in a season that saw the Wildcats snap UConn's 70-game winning streak with a 52-48 win in the Big East Championship game. UConn would go on to win the national title with that one loss as the only blemish on their record. Number 14 all-time amongst Division I women's basketball head coaches in wins with 783 to go along with only 489 losses. Coach has a 61.6 .6 career winning percentage. Very impressive. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then, like last week, Coach Nolan um, had such a, a, a commitment to academics. Um, my favorite stat is that in 42 years, Coach had 99% of his seniors earned a degree. And by, uh, by my back of the napkin math, I think that's one player, maybe two, that didn't get a degree. And, uh, and I can make some calls, Coach, if you want me to get that's him. Two. Two? It's two. Two? I, yeah. I, can, I can call and get, get him to do some remote learning to get those that's degrees. Right. <laughs> we always laugh when we meet each other. When we see each other, we always laugh. <laughs> Uh, but without further ado, it's my pleasure to, to uh, welcome Harry Peretta, retired Villanova women's basketball coach. Thanks, Matt. Um, just to go back to Shelly for a second, um, if you guys are more interested in this, get more interested in the story, you can, I think it's um, ESPN, it was, or what is it, 20 for 20 or whatever those things. It's called um, the final embrace or the, or the, or the first embrace. Yeah. And it's about 17 minutes long. It's, it's pretty good if you want to watch it and learn about the cloisters. It's a pretty unique situation. That's all I can tell you. And um, we, they, they live off the generosity of others. I don't know if people know that. And when I go, I try to bring as much food as I can to last them for like three or four months. But it's really interesting when, you, when you're sitting there talking to her. It's, it's, it's not like you're really talking to a cloistered nun. It's like you're talking to somebody and – some of the conversations we have are really funny. Like they're not allowed to speak. They're only allowed to speak one hour a day. So one of the funniest stories that I ever remember was I was telling her how, you know, people would get on my nerves at Villanova and this, that, and the other one summer. And she said to me, well, Harry, she goes, in your world, you can tell the person when they're getting on your nerves. She says in here, it takes five years to tell somebody they're getting on your nerves. So I thought that was one of the best lines that she ever had <laughs> to me when I was down to see her. So she still has a sense of humor. So, um, but I let, you know, if anybody has any questions about it, I'd be glad to answer. But um, Matt wants me to talk about the zone offense. Um, 
it took me close to seven years to finally develop the offense to where it is now. And Laura, who's on the call, she reminded me that when she played, we had two flashers, Matt, not a designated flasher. And it, that's how the offense evolved. And the funny story about the designated flasher was we used to have multiple people flash. And I was kind of not understanding why the flashers were not touching the ball a lot. So one day, my, it was a week where my, when my son was young, I remember taking him to an ice cream shop. And I don't know if, where we were, but they had like 50 flavors of ice cream. And it took him basically a half hour to decide what he wanted. So next time we go to this mom and pop store, like a week later, and the guy says, Steven says, I'd like to have some ice cream. And the guy says, well, we only have one designated flavor, chocolate. So before he said the word chocolate, Steven said, I'll take it. So I said to myself, well, maybe because we have too many flashers, they're not getting it enough. If we have a designated flasher and everyone knows who it is, that that person might actually touch the ball more. So that's how the designated flasher got started, Matt. So it's, it's an interesting story how you learn that's, from life about something that you do, you know? That's great. It's interesting. That's actually a true story. It's actually a true wow. story. So that's awesome. whatever you want to do from here, yep. Matt. Yep. I'll just uh, share my screen here and I'll pull up. And I'll just uh, preface this by saying um, I, I do a deep dive. Like I, I don't just, you know, it, it, he's a, a great coach, but you know, I, and I knew that he had a championship productions video. Um, but I, you know, I really wanted to dive into the numbers and see really how elite this zone offense was, you know? Um, and so when I did, when I did that, I mean, I, I was astounded. You'll see, you'll see, can, is, can everyone see the uh, Villanova zone offense per synergy? Yes. Everyone sees that? Okay. So synergy goes back to 2010-11 and 10-11 has like a very fraction of a season. It doesn't even have a full data set. So I started here with uh, 2011 and 12 and you can see, oh, and, and also I added, um, coach, since our conversation yesterday, I added the assist to turnover ratio that you mentioned. Uh, unbelievable. But in 2011, starting with 2011 all the way through the present, if you could look, these are, these are the points. The first column is the points. Second is the possessions. So the points per possession, when you divide those is 0.982, then you have the percentile rank there. So if you just go down percentile rank, and that's how they stack up against all the rest of the Division I women's teams. You're looking at 98, 90, 89, 96, 96, 84, 100, meaning there's no team better in points per possession, 93, and then 54 last season. And if you go through also, and I just found this out yesterday, looking at their assist to turnover ratio, and this goes along with coach teaching the players how to play. Their assist to turnover ratio is even more impressive. You look at these, this is their assist to turnover ratio, and then the far column, and that's all offense, not just their zone offense, that's all their offense. And then the division one percentile rank is that last column 97, 99, 100, 100, no team better in the country. 99, 97, 97, 96, and even 91, still last season. So you can see that, you know, forget all the, the accolades that I went through. This guy's teaching elite offense and the numbers are showing it. And the zone offense is what we're keying on today um, that we have, we have, uh, we have information and, and it's just a great system. It really is. It's, I think it's genius in its simplicity and we'll, and we'll see as we get into it. But it's really, really good. Here we go. Now back, now back on the deep dive on the numbers, I just wanted to show here a graph showing the zone offense efficiency and that's percentile rank. As you can see, it's always elite year to year. And then just so people wouldn't say, oh, he just always has great three point shooting. Great, they just shoot him, shoot him into, into good numbers. The three point shooting 
varies year to year. And you can see it goes down to sometimes in the 40s. And yet you see that the zone offense efficiency remains elite. So these players are figuring out ways to score game in and game out on, on, on their sample size of nine seasons. So I found that just incredibly telling and um, impressive. So here we go. Uh, Coach, I'll, I'll hand it over to you for, for the uh, explanations here on the positioning. Um, well, he, he, Matt broke it down, and actually some of his rules are better than the rules that I wrote with uh, the people that helped me design this offense. Uh, one player is a designated flasher. And he adds into the high post. Uh, the designated flasher is a player that you can start anywhere on the court. Their job is to flash inside and out. They can step out on the court wherever they want. They can flash whenever they want. But their job is to try to find gaps in the defense that are created by the movement of the other players, then step out into those gaps, and then step, step back into the high post area and try to get shots both inside and out. Um, uh, and most of the time, this player is, is usually your best player. Uh, I do have more than one flasher on the team. Like, players will compete for this spot because they all want to be the designated flasher because that person's going to touch the ball more than anybody else and probably get more shots. So we have probably on a good year, would you say like four, Lar, on a good year, we have four different people that could do this? Yeah, four. That's okay. accurate. Okay. And then we have one low post player behind the defense. Okay, uh, most often they're, they're at the short corner, okay? But they can basically go anywhere they want so long as they stay behind the defense. And we at times have put guards back there who have stepped all the way out to the three-point line and caught the ball and, and driven it from there. So it does not have to be a big kid. If you have a big kid that can shoot the ball better from the perimeter, you don't have to put them in the short corner if you don't want. You can put anybody you want there. And – that player is designed to keep pressure on the back of the defense where if they start guarding the flasher too much, then the back person should be open or at least be able to touch the ball and create offense. And then the other three players are basically what I call perimeter players. And their job is to basically leave a spot on the, on the court and fill another spot on the court uh, where the zone, wherever the, wherever the spot may be, whatever is open in a gap in a zone, their job is to leave one spot and fill another spot. And the, the funny part is, and I told Matt this, when I'm explaining it to you, it sounds very complicated, but when you see it run, like the best way for me to show people is I, I show them five on zero. And once you see it, you'll learn it in five, basically five minutes. Um, and that's, but, but these are the basic, some of the basic, principles that we use um, and then we you can start by waving like a clock motion you can also start by passing and then the point guard can leave her spot and go fill another spot and the offense then can start so basically when you're coming down the court all the players know what they are the flasher knows what they are low post person the wing, the perimeter players know what what they are and then they all do I just saw, I just, I use the word assume their role. They all just assume their role and then you play against the zone. That's why we say it's unscoutable because basically the players that are running the offense, they really, you can't scout it because they don't know where they're going. It, it only begins when the offense starts. So there's no A to B to C to D. It's just basically leave a spot, fill a spot, dribble drive, all that stuff. So now we get to some, some more concepts players are free to make basketball plays at all time. That means they can dribble drive the ball. Um, they can shoot threes, uh, whatever they want to do. They're basically allowed to do. They want to cut through the zone. When you're leaving a spot and filling a spot, you want to try to cut through the zone. If you can try to cause as much chaos for the defense. And then the flasher gets a better chance of getting open. And then we have attacking the gaps with the dribble. Uh, basically, you can dribble drive the ball in this offense. So it's not uncommon for us to create movement in the zone and then dribble drive the gaps and kick it. Um, 
if you don't have a passing lane, you, you might want to step, you might either want to go back door or step farther out to create a passing lane. Um, sometimes I have shortened the distance of the pass. So sometimes you might want to come closer to the person that's passing you the ball. Sometimes you might want to increase the distance that you are from the person that's passing the ball. Um, so you can be, you basically have to figure that out on your own as you play against the zone. Um, and then the ball handler can wave players through at any time. Um, so if, if, if the offense starts and it kind of gets bogged down and, and someone has the ball at the point or the wing, they can wave in a clock motion anytime they want. Um, you know, on each passer, every, every person leaves a spot, fill a spot. If you're unguarded, okay, the player can look and open for an open shot. Back cut. When you're overplayed, you basically back. So someone else can fill the spot. And then the simplest thing that I tell people is that people always say to me, well, where do you go on the zone? And I just simply say to them, go where the defense isn't. So when you're going through, you might go through to the corner once. Well, next time you might want to go through and step out to the wing because you're going where the defense is. It's, it, it sounds stupid, but you'll understand it when you see it. Um, of the designated flasher, um, the person can pop out to the perimeter for a pass to get a shot or for reversal passes. Um, you, you can go um, get to the rim, get behind the defense. Um, th that person must be a good decision maker. They, they must know how – they have to be relatively smart, okay? Um, shooting ability it makes the position extra dangerous. If you can have a flasher that can shoot threes, then it makes the position even more dangerous because they will get a lot of perimeter shots if they want to get them. Um, and usually it's your, the team's best all-around player. And the next one says, never be stuck anywhere too long. Now, basically what that means is, if you're the flasher, you don't want to be in the high post too long, and you don't want to be on the perimeter too long. It, 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 I don't know how to explain it. It, it, it. Again, when you see it, you'll understand what I'm talking about. So you don't want to be stuck in the position too long, okay? And this person should touch the ball more than any other offensive player on the court. Killing me with these rules, Matt. Um, then you have the next person that's behind the defense. Uh, their job is simple. They just want to go short corner to short corner. They can go block to block. They can go three-point line. They can go anywhere they want, okay? But their job is to put pressure on the back of the defense, okay? And they want to try to be on the ball side as much as possible so you kind of form like a triangle. They're in the, they're in the short corner, flashers in the high post, and somebody on the wing may have the ball. Okay, so that's where they want to be. Okay, and then the person must anticipate where the ball is going. So if I'm in the short corner and the ball is getting reversed, I have to know that they're going to reverse the ball. And I, and I want to get to that other spot before the ball actually gets reversed to the other side. So they have to be a good anticipator. All right, let's get to the video. Let me just ask awesome. Laura for a second. Is that pretty good, Laura? Yeah, I think you covered pretty much everything. Okay, his rules are pretty good, right? Yeah, they're really good. Okay, that's what I thought. I don't know if you want to talk about the different formations that you can start, because sometimes we would start out in 40 and then go into it, or we would just start out straight high-low. with. But you I, you might see that on the screen. Go ahead, Lars. Go ahead. Well, there's just different ways that you can attack it, um, depending on how what the defense looks like. You know, against a standard 2-3, we would traditionally go the 1-3-1 the one, one look. Um, but we would also sometimes start in what we called our 40 offense, which would be a 2-1-2. Two, two. Um, usually the flasher was still in the middle, and then, then we would wave and then end up still being in the zone offense. But usually that would be against a 1-3-1, one, one, for example. So you can run this offense against a 1-3-1, one, one, a 2-3, three, a 3-3. Three. Me too. Yeah, and, and Laura's making a good point. Um, sometimes we're not in any traditional thing. Like we could be in a 2 1 2. The flasher actually could be a point guard and they could be starting on the perimeter. They do not have to start at the high post. So, and even the low purse person who is the short corner person, they don't necessarily have to start low. They can start anywhere they want so long as they assume their role when the offense starts. 
Does that make any sense to people? Yep. Okay. All like right. I said, when you see it, you'll understand it a lot better. All right. Is everyone seeing the video there? Yes. Okay. All right. This is from uh, the season. Notre Dame. Yep. Now, two is the flasher. She steps out, catches it, reverses it. You see her flash back in, and we get a three out of it. We just we created an overload on the other side. The kid that caught the ball right now is our center. So, again, she's a better three-point shooter, so we keep her on the perimeter. We don't put her on the low block. I think she's going to... Kelly, no, that was an example where we started out in the two, that we started out in 40 there. So that was a 2-1-2 two, two look. Yeah. And, and this is where we get the defense moving a little bit. Yeah, we're in a 2-1-2 two, two there. Go ahead, Matt. Good. Yep. So yeah, now flash is kept out. 3-2 here. Yep. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. She drew the defense in. And then we just played from here. You notice they put the ball on the floor sometimes. Sometimes they don't. The flash made a bad step out there, but we got a dribble drive out of it. Let's see if she waves them now. Yeah, she don't see her wave the kid, but we got somebody open, so we just make the pass and score. We don't, if we see something, we'll take it right away. And coach, your, your players can shoot at any time, right? If they have an Correct. open, open shot. First good shot we're looking yep. for. Because most of the time, now this is where we're waving them in a the clock. The flasher steps out, catches it, reverses it. She flashes back in, gets the ball. We get a layup out of it. She went from out, in, outside in to inside out. And then again, we just got dribble penetration on that one. And this one here is, okay, we didn't wave anybody. We just got a skip pass out of it because we're just in the gaps. Sometimes it's that easy. We got two on one at the top there and we wind up getting a shot out of it. She waved him here. Sear waved the kid and the flasher step out. Then we reverse it. That was a pass back. The flasher goes back to the high post. Ball gets reversed. The person behind the defense is able to touch it. We get a two-on-one -on, on one side on the pass back, and we wind up getting a shot. So you don't really know where our kids are going because they really don't know until they see what's in front of them. And the low person, we tell them to go block to block, like short corner, short corner. But if they're a good three-point shooter, we'll have them step out. And sometimes we get that two-on-one -on -one in the corner there, which is what just happened with our big kid, our center, Megan Quinn. So they don't have to always just go short corner to corner. We give them the freedom to step all the way out to the corner there too. And Matt picked up very quickly. We don't try to score in our inbounds, please. <laughs> <laughs> we feel like if we get a possession, we'll get a more quality shot. So now you see the flashes step out. She flashed, now she's flashing back in if you see one. See if we can get her the ball, good. Now we have a high-low triangle on one side. Now she's putting the ball on the floor, which is fine. Then we finally hit the high post and we got a shot out of it. The flasher does not have to step out to the top of the key all the time. They also can step to the wing. Now we get the flasher. She's dribbling. It's a little choppy, Matt. Is that is that everybody? Is it choppy for everybody or just me? Is it? Let me see something here. Maybe it's just my screen. I just want to make sure. Let me. Let me see if I can adjust the setting here. Sorry about that. While you're doing that, why don't you stop for a second, Matt? You can yep. figure out. 
Does anybody have any questions? Because that's the best way to learn this. So Harry, can you, you could change your designated flasher and move the designated flasher maybe to the perimeter or the low post? Correct. You can put the designated flasher. You can change the person right. who's the designated flasher, and you can also change how they start flashing. You can start that. Sometimes we will start the designated flasher as our point guard. Okay. So she'll, she'll wave them, and then she'll start flashing from the wing instead of being in the high post. And that person that in the high post to start actually becomes a perimeter player. Okay. So I will do that during the game just if I think we're becoming a little stagnant or if I think the defense is adjusting to us, mm -hmm. I'll change everything just to give them a different look. And you can do that. You, remember, you can do anything you want. Um, I, talk, I told Matt yesterday, when I showed this to Larry Brown years ago, he was interested in using the designated flasher as a screener and a flasher. So he would use that person as a pick and roll in the high post or pick and roll in the perimeter. Then they would start flashing. He also used them to back screen the top kids that look for flares. And then they would become the flasher. I never used it myself because I felt like the more passes we could make, the offense ran faster. But he liked the picking, he liked the screening concept of it added to this. So that's why I tell people, as I showed this to people over the years, I got different ideas from people. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands that you can add stuff to this if you want, or subtract stuff if you want. Great. Okay, let's see if this is a little better. Best mooter? Is there any noticeable difference in, in the smoothness? A little bit. A little bit? Okay. Yeah. That time, the, the low post person started from the wing and actually went low, if you saw that. Mm -hmm. You see how cutting through the zone makes the zone make so many more decisions? Mm -hmm. You can see the people cutting through the zone. Sometimes they curl out and come back to the same side. Basically, they're doing whatever they want. And then hopefully, if we create enough movement, this is what we get. And coach, real quick, uh, uh, mention what we talked about yesterday when you were talking about the press. Oh, when we're attacking the press, we play one on one or two on two. And I always felt that when you got the ball across half court, there was like a three to five second span in which the defense doesn't really set up. So we actually would look when you're pushing something, it's difficult for them to get set up and match up with you. And we would be in the gaps already at bringing the ball up. So sometimes you get a shot without having to wave or do anything just because we were in the gap and took advantage of enough. Did everybody get that? Uh, the audio was breaking up a little bit, Coach, but – to, to paraphrase, you were saying the first three to five seconds once you get it across half court, the, when they're scrambling to get back into their normal zone positions is when, you're, is when you really want to attack, right? Yes, because I think you can get a shot before they're ready. Yep. Okay. That's why I kept some of the, some of the press in there uh, on some of these clips so you can kind of see how you 
get into it there and attack. Because everybody thinks we, we hold the ball for 27 seconds before we shoot it. But that's not necessarily true. We shoot the ball when we can find a weakness in the defense. So right now we're already in the gaps. So if they do match up with us, now we realize it and we start waving and we start moving. And you can watch the defense. They don't really know who to guard all the time. That was a really good possession there. Anytime the flasher touches the ball at the high post, it's a good possession. See, the flasher's already in there. So now she touches it, kicks it out. She should be stepping out. But she's, she's kind of stuck in the high post, but we're getting something out of it. If she's touching it, I don't really have a problem with her in the high post a little too long. If she's not touching the ball, that's when I want them to move because then she knows that she, it's not hurting the defense if she's not touching it. Keith, you see anything different? Now we have a, a different kid starting in the high post. You see it? She stepped out. Now, she, now she's the flasher. Two is not the flasher anymore. So we changed the flasher there. She steps out. We get a two-on-one. We get a three. You really hurt the defense when you go from inside out. Okay, now we dribbled the ball there. The, the flasher stepped out to the wing that time, not to the high. We got a three out of it. Now we have a different flasher. One's the flasher, I think. Raven should be dribbling the ball. She hasn't dribbled it. But again, that was like a little slow for me, but the high post person touched it, so we were able to get a shot. This time she waves them. Flasher steps out, reverses it, goes back in. And then, and then number one is now the low person. She's not the flasher anymore. Even the low, you see the low person there? She even stepped out on the perimeter there. I don't even care, but, but I wanted to get back there eventually. But if we're putting pressure on the defense, I don't really care. This is the flasher stepping out. We get a reversal. Flasher goes in. We have a high low. These are really good possessions, Matt, right here. You can really see the offense now. It's your boys team, Laura. <laughs> Does he like the zone offense or no? Uh, he wanted to jump on, actually, the zoom. but Oh, really? I don't want you giving any secrets away down there now. And I just want to bring attention, Coach, to you teaching that. You called it a shuffle. Oh, the, shuffle. Yeah, the, I call it like a sidestep or a shuffle step. Yeah, so on the skip here. I mean, like, we just try to teach our kids to yeah. shuffle. And the reason – now, she gets a shot out of it, which is good. But we teach them to shuffle for two reasons. One is your feet are set to shoot the three if you want. And the second thing is you're always facing the basket so you can always pass. Flasher stepping out. Back in, skip pass. She sucked the defense in. We got a skip pass over her head. If you watch the defense sometimes when they're guarding the flasher on the perimeter, when the flasher goes back to the high post, it's amazing how many times they follow her into the high post and they leave the perimeter open. There's, there's the wave and the step out and the reflash. Okay, that kid that caught the ball, she, she's the low person now if you see her. She wasn't the flasher. When she stepped out, she caught it, and I wanted her to be the low person. Watch it. You're going to re yeah, rerun it back, Matt, to the beginning. Yep. See, Mary, when she caught the ball, she went to the low post and said she wasn't the flasher on that possession. That's her. Okay, here, here's where we start. Now, 
Every, now, if you're watching it, you think Mary's the flasher because she started high, but watch. She steps out. She's really the low person. Watch. I should do something different. She goes to the low post now instead of the high post. And we basically have four, a four on the perimeter that time. So sometimes, like I said, that goes to your point about changing the flasher and also changing the position. If you can just freeze it for a second, Matt. Yep. Sometimes when you pass the ball, you don't have to leave the spot. It's, this is going to sound really stupid. But sometimes when I pass the ball, if I stand where I'm at, I am leaving a spot and filling a spot. Now, you may say to me, how's that possible? Well, here's how it's possible. If someone guards me when I step out to the perimeter and I catch the ball and pass it, if the person guarding me leaves me, I don't need to move to get into a gap. The person left me. She created a gap. So all I have to do is stand there, and I've created a gap. So sometimes you don't have to move to leave a spot and fill a spot. Sounds stupid, right? But, but that's what happened on that last play. When the kid passed the ball, defender left her. She stood there. We passed it back. She got a three. Harry, that's a, that's, a, that, that's a really good point that you've never, ever talked about before. Uh, not leaving in, in any of the clinics yeah and the other question I want to ask is the other thing your kids do a pretty good job of is not cutting because one of the things when you put it in they're going to cut on top of that flasher how do you work with them not cutting on top of the flasher what we, are the things you tell them we do um we do three Keith against three with the flasher stepping out then the other people cutting through and I'll be honest with you, Keith, sometimes they do bump into each other, but they all try to talk, communicate. The flasher has the, has the I don't know what the word is, um, she's in charge. So she, you will see during the game when someone's cutting, her pointing at the kid cutting, meaning that I want you to go below me. I want you to go above me. And sometimes when you flash, if you, if you cut kind of like in front of the flasher, and the, and the flasher comes in behind you, she can actually get you open. But we, we kind of do it, Keith, with communication because you're right. Sometimes they do get in each other's way. And, but we do it three on three for them to learn it. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, and the other, th the other thing that you talked about a lot that was really good for us when we went to the, against the one two two, mm -hmm. you would have the flasher almost go down to the low block and wait for somebody to cut and cut right off of them. Correct. Yeah, we used to tell them to cut off their ass. Right. So if they cut in front of me, I would come right off their ass. They would draw the low post person to them, the cutter. Then I would flash in behind them to get the ball. That's correct. But Keith is bringing up a good point, how you can tailor the offense to what suits what you want. So if you want to start the kid low and flash somebody in behind them, whatever, just do it. Do whatever you want. My whole thing is like, and I was telling this to Matt yesterday because he said UCLA runs a lot of, uh, what did you call them, Matt, sets? Sets, yeah. Against the zone? Yeah. Well, again, I go back to Larry Brown. He told me that why can't you run a set if it doesn't work, then everybody just assume their role and, and go right into the zone offense. So once in a while, we will run a set against the zone and the kids know if it doesn't work, they just assume their roles and continue playing. So you can put in stuff that you like that are set plays but, and still run the offense too. <clears throat> just, just for the people that like to run sets against the zone. You don't have to abandon it. My whole problem with sets are what happens when they don't work? What do you do? I always, I always try to coach where – if something doesn't work, we have a contingency plan. So when we run something, they always know if it doesn't work, we're going into this. Even in the man offense, if we run a set play and it doesn't work, they know they're going into the five out or whatever we're running. So for the coaches that like sets, you can run sets, and I think you can run this at the same uh, in conjunction with it. So was, Harry, to just to piggyback off that, when I went from Valpo to Wright State, Mike Bradbury, who's now at New Mexico, we would beat Wright State 
because we would zone him, and he was playing fast with his man offense, and then he'd run set plays against zone. Once we started doing this, he could play fast on against man and fast against zone. It changed everything. Because that you can always go to something, right? Right. Yeah, that that's what I'm talking about. Like basically, the offense is set to run to infinity. That's what I always say. The motion zone offense that we run, it's infinity based. You can run it forever. So that's what Keith was talking about, having something to always go to where the kids aren't confused. They know immediately what they're doing. And, and the other thing, that, and I mean, Laura can speak to this. We do not, we, I'm, I'm probably wrong, but we do not spend a lot of time at practice doing individual passing drills. And the reason we don't is because in our man offense and in our zone offense, we pass the ball. I don't want to say more than any team in the country, but we're right up there. So they're always practicing their passing when they scrimmage. So I don't practice individual passing as much as I should probably because we're passing the ball so often during practice. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. And then also, Coach, touching back on what we talked about yesterday, um, talk a little bit about your progression on teaching it as well. I, I teach it five one zero first, and just so they understand the concepts, and then we add maybe we break it down maybe three on three with no maybe four on four with no uh, low post person. You can do it four on four and just do do away with the low post person. They can learn where to fill the gaps and stuff. But most of it's taught five on five. It's mostly taught by scrimmaging, and I basically throw it at them and teach them as they're playing, you should have won here, you should have won here, you should have went over there, you should have did this, you should have did that. I know, I know a lot of people aren't comfortable teaching it that way, but I think it's the best way to learn. It's like getting thrown into the pool when you're young and you learn how to swim. It's, it's the same concept. Like, it looks shitty. I often tell people that want to try this, do not make an evaluation off the first week because it will look like shit, okay? make an evaluation off the second or third week because they'll get better at it as they go. But again, if you want to break it down, you can break it down. I would break it down four and four and eliminate the uh, low post person because a lot of coaches aren't comfortable in teaching five on five. They like to break it down. The other thing too, Harry, you might want to just talk about or um, add is we practice zone offense every single day. So we play right. against the zone. I mean, it's at least 10 minutes a day that we're scrimmaging against the zone. So the kids are really, really comfortable. with. It's not just, oh, we know we're playing this team this weekend and they play a zone. It doesn't matter who we're playing. Every single day in practice, we slot a good 10, 15, 20 minutes that we're practicing against the zone. Matt asked me that question yesterday, Lark. And I told them that's what we do. Every day we spend at least 10 minutes on, on the zone offense. And we're playing the zone offense more for the offense, not for the defense, because we don't play zone. Yeah. That's great. I'm going to start this back up. Thank you, Coach. Okay. Flasher steps out, reverse. She dribbled it probably too much there. Now the flasher was on the perimeter a little too long there, I thought. Now she stepped out again, and we got a shot. One thing I will say watching, watching your uh, teams play is, you know, there's a lot of communication between them, amongst them. You know, there's, they're telling each other, you know, I can't tell you how many times we're trying to get our players at UCLA to communicate, not just on the defensive end, on the offensive end too, you know. Um, but I thought I – thought, a lot of different players will commu communicate what going through your, your, uh, your clips. Yeah, they do. And like I said, the flasher becomes a cop, yeah. uh, uh, you know, a traffic cop. We like, like I said, we like to start with that clock movement. Yeah. Now it's just a dribble penetration by Mary. That's all it was. Sometimes it's as easy as what it is. T 
You know, we like to get in it as fast as we can. Now we're in it already. The wave, the step out. Now, this, now the guard can also dribble it all the way to the corner, which makes the flasher come farther out or farther over. That's where I talk about increasing the distance or decreasing the distance. Sometimes when you wave them through, the guard wants to dribble it a little deeper just to screw the defense up. These are all the little subtle things you can do during the game to change the look. That time we did a strong side wave where we, we waved two players through and we got a skip pass out of it. And now I said, now the offense just runs to infinity. If we didn't get anything, we wind up getting something late. That's all. The goal is for them never to panic and just keep playing. It's a good flash there. That's just a, you know, that's what we talk about dribble drive from the short corner person. And we stay right in the one three one here so we can get right into the offense. Now we're we're basically in it now. We haven't waved or anything yet. We're probably now now she waves it. And now we start moving. Everybody assumes their role. Dribble penetrate, get a high low out of it. We're just holding the ball for the last shot here, I think, Matt. Yep. Step out, reverse, and we get a three out of it. Because the defensive player on the wing followed the flasher all the way out, and we got the reversal pass. Pass back, dribble drive, get lucky. And then we try to get in it. Like I said, that was those three to five seconds. We didn't get anything, and we just kept playing out of it. We got some. We didn't really do anything special there. Step out. Now, that time she dribbled all the way to the corner, which made the flasher go to the wing. So it, it, it changed where the flasher caught it, and it also changed the direction she flashed back in, if you notice that. See how she dribbles it deep and watch the flasher. Instead of catching it at the high post, look where she catches it now. Now look where she's cutting from. It's a different cut. Instead of from the top, she came from the wing. And that the middle person never saw it. Those are the subtle things that people don't even see during the game that happen. And that's, and that's why I tell the guards sometimes, sometimes dribble to the wing, sometimes dribble it deep. And all I'm doing is just making the flash or catch the ball in the wing instead of the point. People don't even know that we changed something. I don't even know if the team know we changed it. You know what I mean? I just, I just wanted to change the direction where the cutter was coming from. And you see, when the flasher catches the ball, it really gives the other team a lot of trouble. And the girl that's scoring there is only five foot ten inches tall. She's not, a, she's not six foot one or anything. So you don't need to have a lot of teams like to post their big kids, and I call it fighting on the post. I, I don't want to do any fighting. I want to have movement all the time. I think it's easier for a big kid to catch the ball when they're not fighting for it and when they're moving than when they're fighting for it. You're going to have that problem this year, Keith. I think there's just a few more clips here and then uh does anybody have any questions just ask away it's the easiest way for me to you know try to show it to you hey, coach I'll i've ask. got a question go ahead no no go. i was going to ask an honest question like is the is this look really weird to you guys or are you but can't you pick it up a lot easier by just watching it if i tried to explain this to you could you understand it people would get offended when they called me on the phone and they asked me to, to talk them through it. And I said, no, I, you got to understand, I can't. I have to show it to you. And once you see it, I, I just want to know, are people understanding it? That's all I'm asking. So go ahead with your question. Hey, Coach. This is Steve Yang, Georgetown. Hey, thank you so much for doing this. How are you doing? How are you doing? I haven't talked to you in a while. I know. 
enjoying retirement, I bet. Right now I am. I'll tell you right now, I wish I could get more winners at the track, but everything's good. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, man. This is great. Uh, I, I do know it takes a while for, for players to understand it, uh, ran this type of offense on the men's side. And if you don't, you know, they, uh, as a freshman, you don't get it. It takes a while, and that's part of why you, you redshirt your freshmen too. And, and uh, once they become sophomores and whatnot, they get a lot better. And, and uh, I, I love the offense. I really do. So uh, my, my question to you is um, what, what, what's the role of the player who is not a high clip or not a great three-point shooter? Um, so you they're, know, they're, they're a perimeter player? Yeah. Okay. Um, what I would say to you, like on your team, you had some kids that weren't good three-point shooters, but they were pretty good at dribble driving the ball. What I would tell them to do is create as many gaps as they can and dribble drive the ball if you're not a good shooter. Because if you dribble drive the ball, you can cause as much chaos without shooting the ball. So some kids on our team who are not good shooters, I will say to them, hey, dribble drive more if you're not comfortable. And then what will happen is if you can draw the D, you can then kick it to somebody who is a good three-point shooter. So – the point of this is the kids learn what they're good at and what they're not good at, and they try to acclimate it to the offense. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it, it does. Uh, I guess if I'm playing you and let's say, for example, uh, James wasn't the, the most efficient shooter, I guess you want right. to say, and if we're sagging off on her, forcing her to dr drive in, we're not – let's say I tell my players not to – to give her the shot, but if she's driving right. in, we're not going to sink in because we're expecting a pitch out. So yeah. how, how, and I know James was effective against us and I thank you again for not using any of our clips. I didn't see any, but um, <laughs> you know, it, how, what are you saying to James and, and all the other players that, that are getting into the lane, but not getting a shot or not getting a pitch out because we're, we're uh, uh, not collapsing on her. Okay. You know? What you could do is like, Cameron Unkin on our team this year, you knew she shot only like 18% from three. Yep. We would make her the short corner person sometimes. Oh, okay. You could even make Raven the short corner person, but I always felt like she was an okay three-point shooter. But I used to tell her, Raven, go through the zone, cut in front of the flasher. Maybe you can get somebody to give you attention as you're cutting through. That alone will create an opportunity for someone else. And then – even though you may tell a player, okay, we're going to leave this player open. If you make a player cut through as many times, sometimes as we do, the defensive player's natural reaction is to always do what? Run at somebody. So if you cut through enough, you'll get enough people running at you that you can dribble drive the ball. That's what I found at least. That's why we try to run the offense to infinity. Agreed. Thank you. Yeah. Harry, the other thing that you talked us talk, talked us to, into doing that was successful was when the ball goes to the short corner, mm -hmm. diving two people, diving two non-shooters. So you dive your first non-shooter, dive sorry, your you second non-shooter. That second non-shooter, dive two people and, and organize yeah. the diving. So dive, dive two non-shooters. The second one is almost always open. The zone will go with one, but they almost always forget the second one. Yeah, that, that works, Keith. Um, it, it's not as easy as it sounds, but it does work if you can do it that way, yeah. Sometimes you're just not in the right position to dive two people, you know? But I always tell, the, I always tell the whoever's at the high post at least to dive when the ball goes short corner, then go back out. But you're right. You can dive. If you can throw the ball there and dive to people, the second one will be open. You can say, if you're open to your own offense. And I think you're breaking up a little bit, Coach. Is anybody else here in the breakup? I am. Yeah. 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 No. Am I, am I back? I think you're back now, yeah. You got me now? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, that's better. That sounds smooth. Go ahead. That sounds smooth. Someone else? Keith, did I answer your question or no? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. Then the other thing we talked about, Coach, maybe maybe to mention is um, how many players you crash. You, 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 go ahead and, and take that one. Uh, we just tell kids who are like – that think they can get the rebound to go ahead and go. So we don't have doubt with that. So they're free to crash if they have, if they feel like they have a chance. It seemed like it averaged out, and I think you might be bre breaking up again. Um, it seemed like you were it, it. It usually ended up to be where two are back and three are crashing. We don't, we don't, really, we don't really determine certain. Yeah. It's kind of like a feel again, just yeah. like the offense. Yeah. If you think you can get it, go after it. If not, just start backpedaling. Yeah. I mean, Laura played in it, so what do you think, Laura? Yeah, I mean, we were never a great offensive rebounding team, whether it was against whether it was man or zone. So I, I agree with Harry. It was if you were in a position where you could get an offensive rebound, go for it. But if not, we weren't. You know, our our priority was to get back on D and stop transition offense. Gotcha. Gotcha. Most so of the rebounds we got, Matt, were long long rebounds. Sorry. Hey, Coach, Steve again. Sorry. How much emphasis did you put in, in your practice and, uh, like, shooting? Yeah. Shooting drills? Yeah, I thought we did a fair amount, Laura. Do you think we uh, – I think we again, did. Again, Laura. Think we did most people. You said more and, than most people? I would – yeah. Any yeah. teams that I – any of the other um, – teams that I've been on or coached on, I think we do more. And, and traditionally, like if we have kids that come in as freshmen that are not comfortable three point shooters, by the time they're a senior, they're going to be shooting threes, you know, if not consistently somewhat close to that. So my second question to that is uh, what type of shots are you guys teaching them? Uh, the offensive shots and all that. I know you guys talked about the shuffle step and all that, but what, what in workouts are you guys teaching them in regards to the, how to get your shot off? on the move, off the dribble, whatnot? We try to work on both, Steve. And, and we also try – we also teach same pivot foot at Villanova. We don't teach inside pivot. So we're always trying to teach them to hop and catch the ball in a shooting position. Go ahead, Laura. I was just going to add, when we do, we do position breakdown almost every single day. So a lot of times if I know that we're playing a team that's going to zone us, I'll do stuff in my position group that's where they're moving – um, like as if they were in a zone. So maybe they start weak side wing, skip to me, flash to the middle, I'll pass it to them. They hit it back to me, then they step out for a three. So it's, we, we do a lot of shooting off the move too, because in, in our man offense as well, a lot of the cuts that we use, the kids are, are shooting off of, um, off of movement. So we try to incorporate that in to, a lot of our drills. Yeah. That's a good point that Laura makes. We try to simulate whatever kind of shot they would get in the game. We're, we're big on simulating the game. That's what we're big on. Thank you. Coach, uh, just to clarify, when you said the perimeter players, um, their spots, you're saying spots are just like whatever the gap is, correct? If there's not correct. actual like, it's not like five spots on the court or it's just no. whatever's open. Okay. I used to joke with Jay Wright a lot because he would put these little X's on the court to try to teach spacing. So I would say to him, Jay, if I stood on this X, does everything fall apart? Like just to, you know, just to aggravate him. But the whole point is like every spot is open. Like if you move one inch, that's another spot. So there's no, you know, you can teach spacing. Like some kids will say to me, well, how close do I be? And I'll answer them with something stupid, like don't be too close and don't be too far away. So again, I'm, I'm trying to teach them feel. Like, Laura, can you speak to when you started learning this, like how did you learn it? I mean, that I, I, I never knew the rules, the principle, anything, any, any of the principles of the offense. Harry literally just threw me in and said, you're the flasher and you just figure it out as you go. That's why, and, and you know, Harry touched on this already. I think a lot of coaches like the idea of this offense. They put it in, but they don't like it after a couple of weeks because their kids aren't getting it quickly enough. This is an offense that takes time um, and it's not going to happen overnight. Like the kids have to get used to the movement, the cutting, getting a feel for the spacing. But yeah, I mean, it was never something we're not like on day one of 
practice, all right, let's talk about the, the fundamentals of the zone offense. We just jump right into it and you kind of sink or swim. It's always easier for a player to explain it than actually me, you know, because Laura was a really good flasher, but I can remember at the beginning, I mean, I, I was killing her at the beginning. But then you, you kind of learn it. I think it's the best way to learn, unfortunately, the sink or th swim philosophy. When you're forced to get in and, and make the decisions, you know, like, like uh, Chris Oliver talks about on his podcast that you were on, you know, you're, you're in there forced to learn. You have to make the decisions, you know, and that's, that's when the real, real learning happens rather than just go to a spot, go walk to that spot, go to that spot, you know. Like a lot of people, again, I told you about the Michael Jordan thing when he said about the triangle was equal opportunity offense. Well, it, 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 in theory it is, but he's still scoring 50 a game. How come? Because the other players know who the best player is, and they throw them the ball. So Laura was the best player, and they knew that she had to touch the ball at least. If we're, pa if we're making seven passes, she should touch it at least two or three times. They knew that. And they also would pass it long enough for her to get open. They also knew that, too. So your kids will figure it out as it goes. You can kind of hint a little bit, too. Like, excuse me, like, I like you a lot, but, but you're not that good. Laura's better, so throw her the ball. So, I mean, you can get your point across different ways. Harry, uh, one of the things you did at our clinic with Indiana Wesleyan, like you came every other year and basically lectured on it every other year. So you had that team for basically 50 minutes. So it was always amazing how, how well they knew it at the end of the 50 minutes. And yeah, they were, the, really, they were good. They were really good at it, too. One of the techniques you used that I thought was really good just to get more reps in, is you ran it to infinity, and any time they had a shot, oh, right. they didn't shoot it, they just yelled shot, and they just kept playing. Right. That way right. they could get more reps at the movement. I thought that was a good way of you, you teaching that. Yeah, we, we did that a lot at our practices too, Keith. You understand what he's saying, guys? Matt, do you understand what he's yep. saying? Yep. Like a kid would just yell shot, that meant we had an open shot, but we didn't care, we just wanted to practice the offense. So we would just keep on running it to infinity. Yep. That's a good point, Keith. Thank you. Real good point. Coach, oh, I was going to ask a question. This is Danelle Bishop from Cal Poly Pomona. Thanks for doing this tonight. It was awesome. Uh, awesome to see. And it kind of is um, relieves me a little bit because um, sometimes I think my, my newer assistants or newer players are thinking, and she doesn't know how to teach this stuff. And I think, uh, you know, I, we do a lot of, motion and a lot of read your defense um making hard cuts like, you know your players I, I don't know if everybody else knows just how hard your players cut which um, in turn then makes other your other players open the harder they cut they'll either be open or their teammate will be open um so i think it's just awesome awesome to see but i think some sometimes coaches and players are so set on they want all these rules and all these things that you're supposed to do um and, and i love what you know, what your teams have, have been able to do just by reading their defense and just playing basketball. And, um, and ultimately, I think that's, you know, what's made your, all your teams just so successful. Well, Roly Massimino told me something a long time ago, even though he didn't do it. He used to say to me, it's the perfect way to play basketball, but I'm going to do it this way. He used to run sets because that's what he knew, you know what I'm saying? But I tell a lot of coaches, as I told Matt this last night, it has to be comfortable – you have to be comfortable teaching it. If you're not, then don't teach it. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I, I just think it's something that Dave Gavitt a long time said to me, he said, there's nothing new in basketball. He said, the only thing new is if you can take a combination of ideas and put it together into one thing. And basically what this zone offense is, is a combination of ideas, high, low, short corner, um, leave a spot, fill a spot, power the ball so it, it's just a combination of ideas tried to put into one way of playing so again like I said if you're if you're comfortable with it like you said it's great if you're not then then don't do it yeah yeah and then I always just remind my players you know if you're going to make a mistake just go hard you know if you just go hard and make a hard cut and at the end of the day as a coach I think we can all live with that and I'll tell you another thing too even when our players don't really know what they're doing if you, if you move that much against the zone, you're going to get a shot by accident. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes we would get a shot by accident. And I said, she went to the wrong spot. And Joe Mullaney would say, what do you care? You know what I mean? She, she got a good shot. I said, all right, you're right. It's part of the offense. So 
half the stuff that we have on offense, even our five out stuff, have come from kids who either made a cut that they weren't supposed to make or a pass that they weren't supposed to make. And instead of me yelling at them, I just said, okay, it's part of the offense. And then move on. It's part of the offense now. So I just think that it, it, it gives them, a, like Matt says, a way. This is not an offense. It's, it's a way of playing. It's not necessarily an offense. I, I, I hate to say offense. And, and therein lies the beauty, right? Yes, that's the beauty of it. it, yep. it like I said, Roley would say it's the perfect way to play basketball if, if you can learn it. But, and again, nobody repeats this to their men's coach, but men's coaches who watch it like it, but they say to me their players won't necessarily buy into it. When I talk to, like, more of the high-level men's coaches that coach high-level Division One teams, they, they, their players really won't buy it because it, it's not enough dribbling for them or enough pro-type play, what I call it. And, 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 he, and they're right. If, if the kids aren't going to buy it, then don't teach it. You know what I'm saying? And, and, but again, again, I think I told Matt this yesterday, even when I showed this to Pat Summit, when I was showing the zone offense to her team for the first time, one of her post players, who was a very good player, was giving me a dirty look because I put her as a short corner person. So basically I said to her, I said, you're looking at me because you think I think you suck. And she says, yeah because you put me here. I said, you don't understand. We're putting you here and moving you. You will get the ball. But they, she just assumed that she, I think she stinks. So I put her there. You know what I mean? So, you know, you know, so it's harder for higher level coaches sometimes to get their players to accept it. And plus a lot of coaches, I told you yesterday, Matt, they like their post players to post up on the block. That's what they like them to do. So, Again, it's not doesn't make them wrong and me right. It doesn't. It doesn't. It just means it's a different way of playing. That's all. Yeah, and like you mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, you know, you can you can take a lot of these concepts, you know, varying the number of players on the perimeter, and you can still have a, a player, you know, get that post up and and you know, if you have that dominant post player, you can add that to your version of this zone offense. You know, it's just I think that the beauty of this is getting the players to learn the cuts and the plays and the feel. You, you, you said it, uh, I don't remember when you said it, but you said you're teaching them the feel of it, you know, the feel of the, of the game and the zone. And I really, I really love that. And, and, and you can still have that whatever little pet thing you like to do and, and, and still teach the players the feel of it. Yeah, I just think that, like when I said, don't be too close or don't be too far away. Well, they figure it out yeah. and they learn how to play together. Yeah. I, used to, I used to equate it to a, a good playground team. Like when I was younger, we would have five guys that knew how to play and, and, and it was fun, you know? So, and I don't know, if you want to try it, try it. I mean, you know, I'm always free to give me a call, ask a question, whatever. You know, when I make my uh, United States tour, I'll stop in and aggravate you to death. Confuse you to death, Matt. By the time I, I'm done, I, you won't I be able to play. It. I love it. I love it. Well, I, Coach, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. If anybody uh, has another question, now's the time. Uh, hey, Coach, th this is Steve Yang again. Sorry, I, I, I mentioned this in the chat, and I was talking to Laura about this too, but I love seeing your alumni games because they still run your offense. And the, the game of basketball has never forgotten. That's um, kind of funny, but you're right. I got to get embarrassed sometimes. <laughs> watching like 45 year old people run run the spread you know well it's great because you take you take those five and go to the ymca and they can hustle people i mean <laughs> you think about it but no it, it's great and I'll i, I just you, love it. i'll tell you a great story we were recruiting this this kid wanted to transfer from Rutgers. she's down talking to me and she says you know we ran the spread when we were younger in in israel because liad who played for me taught the spread to the israeli people so it's run in Israel and Denmark. So I'm, I'm trying to take over the world by just, you know, it's like invasion of the body snatchers. I'm trying to like get into every country, you know what I mean? So I can take over. Then I can, then I could play like those chess games where I would have like five games on at the same time. And I would just go from game to game and just, you know, run a different offense just to aggravate everybody. That's what I'm going to do in retirement. <laughs> Well, well, I'll say this that to those that's still on and listening is that 
you were coaching, telling the action during one of our games, and even we couldn't guard it. You were telling your players what to do exactly, and we had trouble guarding it. And so when, when Matt's talking about unscoutable, he's absolutely right, and that makes it hard for, for teams playing y'all. Um, but you all do a great job, and it takes a lot of patience and time and commitment. And, and uh, I know I'm in love with the system and, or, or the play. And thank you so much for this, Matt. Thanks for, for putting this together, too. And going to Danielle to, to, to talk to you one second, what he was saying about how I was instructing them during the game, once the players kind of learn what they're doing, and, and you can actually do that during the game. If they make a mistake, you can kind of guide them to the right spot. So all these offenses were designed to make me part of the game. So I was able to communicate to my players without calling timeout. So I can communicate on the fly. So that's one of the things you could try to do if you decide to do this. You can try to get mentally in tune with them. That's why the best way to guard Harry Perez's teams was to put one player on Harry and four people on the other players. <laughs> That's Keith, great. Keith, Keith also was responsible for the development of this offense, too. So he was part of it, too. Oh, man, that's great. Well, thank you so much. Um, and like, unlike, um, Coach, we talked about yesterday, um, Coach has been gracious enough to, to share, share all this information so if anyone wants any any the any of the slides or the video or or um we even um recorded this so if anyone wants to, to to go back and watch this just feel free to email me and um and i'll be sending this stuff out and it's coach has just been so gracious uh in sharing sharing, sharing everything thanks you saved me a lot of money tonight because i wasn't able to bet so you saved me money so. <laughs> all right good thank you all right. See, good to thank, see you. Guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much, guys. Thanks, Colleen. I appreciate it. Thank you, Coach. Okay. Thank you. See you, guys. Talk Bye. to you soon, Coach. Colleen, see you later. Good to see you. All right. You again. Take care. Enjoy Bye, retirement. Colleen. Bye. Bye. It's been a Bye. long time since we've seen each other. It's been forever. Yep. Yeah, you're right. Take it easy. Okay. Thank you. Oh, no, Matt. Know what I want you to do? Yeah. I want you to talk to uh, what's his name, the men's coach. I, uh, God, what's I keep forgetting his name. Um, Mick Cronin? Mick, yeah, Mick. Tell him that I want to know if he's gotten any winners at San Anita because I know for a fact that he's sneaking down to San Anita whenever he can. Oh, so do he, you? Oh, he's not fooling me. So you can tell him when you see him tomorrow or whatever, you tell him Harry Pareto knows you've been sneaking down there even though the coronavirus is going on. I think I'm stupid because he probably has TVG too. He ain't fooling nobody. I used to aggravate him to death when he was in Cincinnati. <laughs> I'll tell him. Yeah, you tell him. All right, take it easy. Thanks, Coach. See you. Later, Harry. All right, see you guys. Bye-bye. Bye, Helen. Bye, Steve. Drive carefully. Bye. Thanks, Matt. Bye, Thanks, Clint. guys. Hey, Devontae. You so I was you. driving. See you guys. We see ya. Bye-bye. See ya, Matt. All right, Colleen. We'll talk later, okay? Yep. Good yep. job. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, good good PowerPoint too. Excellent. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Take care. All right, bye. bye.